Welcome to another installment of the Jacksonville Broadcasters Association interviews of legendary figures in local broadcasting. And today we're talking with Jade Luthie, known for her time for Rock 105's Rude Awakening and also many years of radio experience in Jacksonville and in Miami. Jade, a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much. So Jade, you've had a long and varied history working in radio. Yeah. And your interest in listening to it actually started in the Midwest. Tell us about that. Yes, it did. I was raised in Ohio and in Northeast Ohio, which is Maslin Canton area. And when I was a teenager, you had your little clock radio there at night and you'd try to pull in any kind of signal because in Maslin, there wasn't any. And so I would be listening to the Cleveland radio station and I could hear Big Wilson on there. And it was like an AM station, but it was big back in the 60s, you know? So I, I was drawn into it very much through Big Wilson in that radio station. And little did I know that I would be working with Big Wilson down the road when I was about 30. <laughs> you know? And it just really kind of all pulls it all in. And I think radio just came to me by osmosis. I just drank it in, not even knowing that I was wanting to be JD down the road. You know, because this was, you know, something as much as you enjoyed listening to radio, you had never thought all those years earlier that you'd work in the field. Never thought of it. Uh, in the 60s, early 60s, women went to school, got married, had kids. Oh, they dated two years. They were engaged one year, got married and had at least two or three children. And that's how I was, you know, that's the way you were raised in the Midwest. Uh, I married a guy who worked for IBM, and most people know IBM stands for I've Been Moved. So we moved all around, and we moved up to Chicago, and in Chicago I heard Larry Lujak, who was quoted as being super jock, and he was, he was wonderful. I adored him. It was like a two o'clock to six o'clock, that's what I did. I listened to him religiously. I loved everything, every nuance. I adored what he was doing. And again, never would have thought that I would have been in radio, never. I also lived across the street from a guy by the name of Tom Parent who worked for Warner Brother Records. And he'd bring the records to, the, to my house and he'd say, listen to this and tell me if you think one of these are a hit. And I'd listen to it and it was the Doobie Brothers and I was like, yeah, that's, that's a hit. He's like, I don't know if that's, uh, that's, that's a hit. And pretty soon, Doobie Brothers were a hit. So again, music got brought into my life like that. But again, never thinking that I would be in radio or in the music business at all. So it kind of drew me into it instead of me being drawn to it. And then we moved to Miami, which is where my life did a complete change. I got divorced. I had not worked the whole 12 years I was married. I had gone to school and I had studied astrology because I found it very interesting. I wanted to prove it didn't work, but it does. So I, I studied it and I taught it and I had people coming to me wanting me to do their astrological charts. So I did, and it turned out the one guy that I did was very close friends with a guy by the name of Eric Rhodes. Now Eric Rhodes, most people in radio know who he is. At that time, he was down at 96X in Miami. He was the PD, or yeah, he was the he was the music director and Jerry Clifton was the PD. Oh my gosh. You couldn't have two 
better people to kind of like push you and pull you and take you into radio and have you cut your baby teeth than those two. For instance, Eric would say to me, just because you see all five lights lit doesn't mean that everybody is listening to you. It just means five people are listening to you. And that's kind of the mentality that I always kept through radio. Just because all of the lines were lit and everybody was saying, oh, I listen, I, it only meant that those five were listening. And it kind of keeps you very grounded. Jerry Clifton was a radio god. I mean, just a radio god. And everything that he taught me about being true to your school of, of you know, the competition and the competitiveness of, at that time in Miami, it was Y100. So it was 96X and Y100 basically going after each other all the time. Top 40 battle? Yes, and it was it was wonderful. It was just wonderful because you would always try to outdo the other one and it really gave you a loyalty to your school. And Jerry was of the mindset, if it's not broke, well, we're going to break it and we're going to make it better. Jerry went on to do other fabulous things. He is, like I say, a radio god. I am so thrilled to have Eric and Jerry as my two first guides into radio. Eric went on to um, do wonderful things. He's owned stations, he's been a programmer, he's been a GM, and he also has Radio Inc. magazine, which is, from, he's, he's just wonderful he, and the best friend a person could ever have and really got me into radio. I would be there and people would call in and I would do their charts on the air. And people would say, you know, well, she's got to know who these people are. And I had no idea. It was like the phone lit, we picked it up, I wrote the dates down, I told them what I thought was happening. And after so long, people realized, well, she can't know this many people. This is not a setup, you know? I really knew what was going on. I had a gift. I had a gift for being able to look into somebody's chart and tell them what their personality and what the problems were that they were dealing with at the time, and it went over great. And the first day that you were in the studio, you fell in love with it. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. You put those headphones on and it was like, well, I've arrived, this is perfect, this is what I was meant to do. And again, I am dyslexic, so I have a real hard time reading the written word, okay? I am very good at ad-libbing or talking back and forth or regenerating a thought, but to sit and read, no. I was not very good in production. I mean, I am first to say not good in production. Never was my cup of tea. Now, if you wanted to sit down and do a funny commercial and have it be ad-libbed, that was great. But to, to read somebody else's word, not for me, dyslexic. When 96X ended, you knew, though, that you were going to stay in the business one way or another. Oh, absolutely. I got a job right away, and I got a job at WYOD, the wonderful Isle of Dreams. And it was terrific, and that's where I started to work with Big Wilson from the days I had listening to him up in Cleveland when I was a teenager. And he was wonderful. He was just wonderful. And at that station, I also worked with Mike Ranieri and Tommy Charles, which is a Jacksonville staple, you know? Ranier used to be at the Ape, I think here's some Yes, time. before uh, WIOD, I believe, yes. Mm -hmm. And that was a great experience to work with those, those people, and Big was just wonderful. And again, I did, you know, astrological readings, and because it went over so well, then they gave me my own show on at night, uh, following Sandy Payton and right before Larry King, because at that time Larry King was live on WIOD in Miami. So I did my own show there and did about 27 charts a night. Now you keep that up for any length of time, 
you you don't know that many people and it would come back and they go I, I can't I can't believe this I can't believe what she's saying and one of the for instance that I can give you is I had said to a lady I see drugs all around you and she was like no I don't do drugs I have no drugs I have nothing I have nothing to do with drugs and I was like my astrological you know what is hanging in the air here and i know i'm right you know and i kept trying to press her and she was very adamant and then finally i said are you a nurse and she said well yes i am <laughs> and i'm like oh but you have no drugs around you at any given point you know so it's like what i was seeing you had to try to make them realize what you were saying it can be interpreted in many different ways when I say I see a lot of drugs around you I'm not saying I see you putting a needle in your arm I'm saying I see a lot of drugs around you and finally after you keep pushing on a person they could realize that she she's on to something here you know doing those readings and bonding with the callers that was really kind of a great experience as far as learning to relate to people wonderful wonderful it is how i have always had in my radio career of talking with the audience never talking with the mic but talking with chris or talking with the audience and never trying to hide or try to be anything that i that i wasn't you know when you heard me laugh on the air it was a genuine laugh you know I was never anything but myself on the air which for good or bad I don't know but it worked is it your belief that you know radio personalities especially if they're doing it day in day out they got to be who they are because if they're not people are going to figure that out absolutely absolutely and I I think that unless you can do that you might as well stay out of the business and I think most of the ones that aren't doing that are time and temperature kind of guys. This is what we're supplying, this is what we're doing, this is the time, and this is the temperature, and we have no personality on the air at all. And I find that very boring, very, very boring. When you were at IOD, did you get to work with Larry King at all? Uh, no, he came in after me. Uh, I did not find him to be amusing at all. <laughs> Let's just put it that way. But I did get to work with Big, and I loved that. And I did get to go to promotions with Mike Ranieri, and I loved that. And Tommy Charles is the first person that I did a two-person morning show with. And we did that on Sundays, and we had fun. On. We just had a great time. And then he moved and went to Jacksonville. And how was it that you wound up in Jacksonville? I was at a radio station after WIOD. It was called The Lady, and it was programmed for singles only. And it was an R-rated radio station, basically. And it was great fun because you had free reign. You had free reign. Uh, got a lot of the news stories from adult magazines. <laughs> I mean, one of the promotions we did was we gave away bikini bottoms, but no tops. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and it was great fun. And I worked with some really good guys. Uh, Dave Denver, who is true name is Richard Lippincott, who passed away not too long ago, ended up in the loop in Chicago. And when we were on this little radio station, it was an AM radio station, just as FM was big, you know, and we didn't think anybody was listening. I mean, we were having a blast, <laughs> getting away with it, having so much fun. And we did one promotion at a club up in Fort Lauderdale, and we all piled into a limo, and we went to this, you know, promotion. And when we pulled in, the cars were lined up North Federal Highway, and you, we could hardly get in. And all of us sat in the car and went, Oh my heavens, they're listening. <laughs> you know, they're listening. It really was a surprise to all of us. Well, the station was doing well, but the station manager in ratings and stuff, we were holding our own. It was doing well. But the manager wanted to go to an automated radio station. He could make more money, which I didn't, I was not on the money side of things at that time at all. And so he got everybody 
resignation and everybody left, but he wanted me to stay to read the news. And I thought, well, I'll stay for a little while and read the news. I had three kids I needed to feed and I hated it. I was there in a radio station all by myself and at the top of the hour I would do some news and then I'd be in the radio station all by myself and I thought, if it's not fun, I don't want to do it. So I quit there and Buddy, who was the morning guy with me, Buddy Hollis, who I had so much fun with, he had sent a tape, unbeknownst to me, to Rock 105 to get a morning guy job. And I happened to be on the tape because it was basically a two-person show at that time. And when they heard the tape, they decided they wanted me, but they didn't want Buddy. And I was like, oh, man, how do I tell Buddy? <laughs> I can't tell him that. And so he said, just come up and see what we're all about. So I went from Fort Lauderdale to Jacksonville in 1980. And Jacksonville in 1980 is not like Jacksonville is today. Was a culture shock for you at first? Oh, my Lord. It was like, where are the high rises on this beach? There were no high, it was called the blighted area. The beach was known as the blighted area. And coming from South Florida, it was quite a shock. And all of the clubs in South Florida, it's like, you'd get your son, you'd go and you'd be all decked out and being ready for the fun. And up here, it was like plaid flannel shirts and all of these long haired, guys and I'm like what what is going on in this town nothing evidently you know so the beach was quite a shock and I met the they wanted to have me meet them at Jerry's at the beach well I don't know what Jerry's at the beach is like now but back in 1980 <laughs> you didn't want to go to Jerry's at the beach and so I went in and I looked around and the guy who was supposed to be doing mornings that they were going to hire me to do it with, he looked at me and I looked at him and there was no chemistry. He liked me about as much as I liked him, just no chemistry. And I looked at John Brownlee and I said, John, this isn't for me. And I went back to South Florida. Well, I got a call and Vic Adderhold, who was the GM at the time, said, we really want you. We fired the morning guy. <laughs> like, oh, my God. And we're going to give you more money if you would come up. And I'm like, I'm bringing three kids with me that are going to be taken away from their father. I want to make sure you know what you're getting. So I said to him, that tape has been edited. I break up all the time. I stumble over my words. I have way too much fun. On the, he said, you're exactly what we want. Come up. So I decided, okay, I'm coming up. But I kind of needed that understanding that what you get is, is what you heard is, might not be the same, because I do. Well, I went on the air with John Brownlee for a little while until Chris came into town. And then Chris and I met the minute he walked into the studio and sat down and we turned the mics on. And that's how we met for the first time. Never had any conversation before going on the air together? Never had any conversation at all. And actually, we were there before the walls were built in that studio. 1980, right? 1980 on 99 Hogan Road. And they had just moved from the beach to this facility. And they had like the metal strips where the drywall was going to go and everything. And you had a room here and he had a room over there. And there was a big window there between us. So I was sitting in this room and he was over there. And it just worked beautifully. we still friends to this day. And I could not have asked for a better partner on the air than Chris Jones. He was tremendous. Very talented. The roles that each of you had seemed to complement each other. Very much so, yeah. He did a, a lot of the writing and I did some of my own writing and of course I wrote the news and we had like the rude news and we'd try to come up with something and I remember many a day when it's like the clock is ticking, he's already got his stuff written. And I'm like, what am I going to, and I had to like scramble to write out something and 
it just really worked. It was it was just great, irreverent and edgy, and it was just wonderful. It was just great. They brought you to town to topple the Grease Man. Was that part of the goal? Absolutely. That's why we were brought to town. We want you to beat the Grease Man. That is your job, and we did it in one book, which was. I have to say, pretty good. <laughs> pretty good. You didn't expect it would be that soon at all. Fairness. I did not expect us to be that big of a hit. I really did not expect. And we didn't know, you know. And then after we got there, not too long after we got there, there was they were holding their birthday party. And every night was at a different place. And Chris, would, Chris went, and he came back. He said, I'm never doing this without you again. He said, you've got to go. <laughs> I said, well. So I would go, and it was like, all of a sudden I'd be in the middle of the room and they were tossing me up in the air. I'm like, what is going on here? You know, I had no idea, again, that we were being that well received that fast and that is fast that is very fast so we took him out in one book and within two years he was out of this city because right after we took him out of his number one spot which he rightly deserved to have until we got there uh he was very very good i mean you can't beat the grease man but we did and they changed it to a country format. Well, that wasn't for the Greece. I, I, I don't think APE was smart at all in making that move to make it country. Reactionary, perhaps. Perhaps, perhaps. Uh, you know, I didn't understand all of the business side of radio at that time. I really didn't. Uh, like I said, I didn't know anything about cost per points. I was never that much into the ratings. I didn't really understand the ratings all that well. I was having a good time, and we were doing great and that's all that mattered to me personally. You know, that I was representing that radio station to what we were putting out, which was pretty high quality morning show. When you look back, you know, all these years later, at, you know, your time, you know, getting into the business and all, it seems that there was like so many progressive and forward-thinking people who Absolutely. took you under their wing. Absolutely, absolutely. Starting with Jerry Clifton. You know, Jerry was, a radio god and it always had very progressive and bold action and when you went to rock 105 again very progressive in rock radio um, wonderful production wonderful production and so missed in today's radio market to my opinion uh, back then you had good, solid competition. Well, now, if the ape is putting out this kind of a promo or if the ape is putting out this kind of a commercial, we got to step ours up and let them come to us and try to emulate us. And it kept, you know, that good conversation and good communication between our staff to outdo their staff. And then when it turned into duopolies and LMAs and everybody joining, and I, I thought that was the kiss of death of radio, and to this day, I still think it is. Yeah, it's going to be interesting to get your take on that, because I think certainly you're qualified to, you well, know, really... Well, I don't know about qualified, but I know it certainly upset me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that, I'll say. You know, but to be getting that in a little bit, obviously, to talk more about that period of time, you know, those first few years for you in the market. Right. I think what's fascinating to me is, although they were like, okay, you guys bring down the grease man, they kind of like gave you this very, you know, they, they let you all be you. Absolutely. There wasn't a lot of like, okay, we're going to do, you know, this, we're going to do that. It's like, okay, just figure it out, feel it out on the air. Right. And we did. And one time they brought us into this station and said, we need to have a little less chatter in the morning. We need it to be, you know, a little bit different. And so the very next day we went in and we played it their way. And at about 10 o'clock when we went off the air, we came in and they said, no, 
you guys just do what you were doing. <laughs> just do what you were doing. Because it had, it lacks personality. And as far as radio is concerned, radio is personality, and it's personality for the local community. And it seems like part of the reason why you and Chris thrived is you didn't have consultants breathing under your necks. Well, if we did, I wasn't too sure of them. They, I didn't get involved in, in the consultancy of the radio station. Um, I, I know that there were some out there, and I think uh, Burkhart Abrams was a very progressive and a very good uh, consultancy firm. Now, there's, I thought were good, but there's a lot of them that come in and they go, oh, you need to tone this down, you need to make them be this, they can't do that, and it's, you're coming from a market from nowhere, and it's just like me coming from Fort Lauderdale to Jacksonville, it's like two different worlds, two different worlds. And I think a lot of times the consultants get in the way. I think you have to have GMs that understand programming as well as understand sales. And that is very difficult. Uh, Steve Avalone, I thought, was very good at that. Now, Steve, I worked with him and John Hunt at uh, Y100, or Y102. And um, WIVY here. Yes, WIVY. Yeah. And they, Steve was terrific to my mind. He understood sales, but he really understood programming and he loved programming. And that made it nice for the talent part of it too and made a nice blend back and forth between the two of them, I thought. Did he seem to be more the exception as far as a general manager who got programming? Yes, I think so. I think so. Most of them come from the sales side of it that I have been involved with. How did you wind up g going over into sales? How did that happen? Well, after, in 1987, in January, I had gone into the, the manager at the time at, I, at uh, Rock 105 and said, after this last, when this en book ends, I want to be off of the air and you can either lose me completely or you can lose me to sales. And who better to sell this station than somebody who helped create it from the ground up? I got it, I understood it, and I can sell what we created. And so they decided to let me go into sales. And What changed? I mean, obviously all things change over time, but you know, was it competition? Was it the apes return to FM? No. Was it, you felt it, like you'd done this so long? Yes, I was like, things had transpired and other people were brought into the morning show. I didn't really particularly think improved the show and I just felt as though Chris and JD had done what they were supposed to do and now it was time for JD to go do what she could do. And the only thing I ever sold before that was Girl Scout cookies, but I sold the heck out of those Girl Scout cookies. I really did. I sold enough for me and my friend to both go to camp. So I know I can sell. Uh, but to sell a product that you, and <laughs> I knew about cookies, and that you know about, you can sell. You can sell. And to have an eight year run of being number one or number two radio morning show people know who you were so when i would call up and i'd say hi this is jd from rock 105 and i was wondering if i could come in and talk with you about your advertising the doors were open to me which was wonderful because then i could go in and talk to them about what i knew my product my station could do for their product and their business i really had no idea about cost per point and all the rest of that i sold it on what I can do for you. Relationships. Yes, I know that my product and your product will do wonderful things together. And I like to sell to make your business grow. And a lot of people sell to make money for themselves. A lot of people in sales, as soon as they sign that contract, they know to the penny what their commission is gonna be. Not me, I didn't know, I just knew 
I got one, <laughs> you know? What surprised you the most going over from the creative side to the business side? Uh, the cost per point. <laughs> yeah. The cost per point and the ratings, how much the ratings were involved in this that I didn't really have that comprehension. I knew it was good for business, but I had no idea. Um, I did not realize that there were some things that were d being done on the air that could offend a certain advertiser to buy your product. You know, um, it was very hard in sales it, to sell certain programs because this one said this about that and this one said, yeah, but what about the whole the whole package. I knew what my radio station could do for their business, and I think they trusted me in knowing that. I didn't go in selling the ratings. I did not go in saying, you need to buy my station because we're number one in this and that. And the other. You need to buy my radio station because we have your customer. It would seem that the changes that you made in your career, the common threads, confidence, lack of fear, and adapt quickly. Yes, I, I really have no fear. I, I really, maybe a little bit of this, but I really have no fear. Uh, I've never lived my life. I've quit radio stations because my principles I had to live by, not their principles. And when they crossed the line of what my principles said, then I'm sorry, I have to move on. And I've never found that to be a problem in any aspect of my life. People would say, <laughs> Lee Nixon, who was a wonderful saleswoman at TV4, it, she was fabulous. And everybody in town knew and probably still does know Lee. And when I quit <laughs> a job, she said, Jade, you cannot quit a job at your age without a job to go to. And I said, oh, I can't. Well, I'm glad I didn't know that before <laughs> because I've always been able to land on my feet because I had two different backgrounds. I had sales and I had on-air experience and I could get a job somewhere in that and if it wasn't in radio, I knew I could get a job. I knew I could get a job, but I always, I don't think I've ever been unemployed for more than two to four days, ever. And that's with quitting a job and not having a job to go to. And these are qualities that people who are new in the business or just getting into the business, you know, could have. It's like, look, you've got to be able to believe in yourself and adapt. That's right. And a lot of them are scared and they don't want to. They'll go along with the flow because that's what the boss says. Well, if you ask any boss that has ever had me as an employee, they would tell you, well, no, she doesn't play that game. <laughs> no. You would let them know what you were thinking. You would let them know. It's Absolutely. like, hey, look, you know. Absolutely. Like yeah. And if we can't come to some kind of agreement, well, then I've got to move on. When you look back at your years on air here, what would you say were like maybe the two or three biggest individual memories that stand out? Well, on Rock 105, um, there are quite a few. There are quite a few. We had some very good promos. We did a whole thing at Wild on Wednesday at Big Daddy's, which was I'm not a drinker. I was a mother of three kids. I never really went to the bars, but every Wednesday you had to go to Wild on Wednesday. And I mean, there were some great people that I met there. Dave Lubeck and all of the Lubecks and all of the, the Van Zandt. I mean, they were all our guys, you know? And one of them passes, like Dave just passed away. That's our guys. Those were our guys. Those were the 18 to 49 year old guys. Those were ours. And that was a, a great memory for us. We had so much fun that. Um, a couple of the hard memories were the day John Lennon died. That was real hard. Um, and it's like, how do you handle that? You get well, in that morning and it's exactly. like, how do you handle uh, I came into the radio station, Lex was doing all nights at the time and you know you're familiar with Lex and Terry now but at that time Lex was doing all nights and when I came in at like five in the morning Lex said John Lennon died and I just went back and hit the wall I I couldn't believe it and then when Chris came in who was a huge Beatles fan and a huge John Lennon fan I had to tell him
And that was a very hard day. That was a very hard day for us. How did you approach that on the air? Seriously. We were very serious and we were very solemn about it and sad. And that was not Chris and JD, you know. There was not a lot of fun that day. Uh, another time that was not fun is when the Challenger blew up. And that's another very strong memory. I was in, at that time, doing a public affairs program and you know the red light for you know don't enter while they're on air in their recording as soon as that light went off they came flying in the room and said the challenger just blew up in the air and I'm like the what did what <laughs> you know so you've got to go from being an irreverent JD it you know six to ten and at about 10 30 11 o'clock go back in and be Walter Cronkite and it is quite a turn and you have to be able to pull that off and I think I did I hope I gave him as much as I could at that and not be overly solemn or overly you know handled it correctly it was a very difficult day you got a really flip the switch. For people who are getting into the business or going into it, that's the thing. You've got to be able to have like a number of different, uh, I guess, tools, yes. you know, to be able to adapt yes, to things like this. Yes, you do. And, you know, maybe for me it was easier because uh, I was older than most of them. You know, I was 12 years older than Chris and at least 12 years older than Lex. Uh, I was the older one there. Uh, I had a lot of that experience and having three kids and going through, you know, near losses of my children from time to time for different illnesses or whatever, and the loss of a parent and, you know, different experiences to pull from. I wasn't just a 24-year-old kid. So you have a lot more experience to pull from, and that may have helped me as well on those type of days. As you reflect on it now, was it challenging as a woman to get into radio at that time? It wasn't challenging at all to get in, but because it would just drew me, drew me in. I will say it was challenging to keep your identity as a woman because back then you were one of the guys and you better step up to the guys talk, which can be a bit of a locker room in a rock and roll radio station. And for some times, it got to the point where I was like, hmm, I don't think I'm comfortable with that. But you know, not to the point that I'm uncomfortable enough to quit, but you've got to learn how you can flow with them so that you can still be one of the guys, but not so much that you lose the fact that you are a mother of three, which was never really brought to attention on the radio station. You know, people would think I was 22 years old, size five blonde. You know, you can think whatever you want on a radio station because they can't see you, which was really nice uh, but it really was kind of difficult to pull that off and still be one of the guys but I enjoyed every one of them I enjoyed every single one of them that I worked with um, there was Lex and he was terrific and a, such a good guy and you know Brad Messick was the PD at the time and Brad was kind of an odd duck but not not to the point that you wouldn't be able to relate to him. John Brownlee, so much fun, so much fun. Charlie Logan, another great guy. I mean, just a bunch of guys that I worked with that were really good. Rick Tracy, he took, a he was a little dicey for me to get real comfortable with because Rick was Rick and he was more than a little rough around the edges. A bit know? dry at times as I recall. Yeah, he was a little rough around the edges um, and had some alcohol problems that 
everybody knows about. I'm not dropping a big secret here, you know. Um, and because of that personality and me not being a drinker and not really understanding that whole club scene and, you know, all the roughness that it was there, you know, he and I never really were real close. We didn't mesh well. But, you know, George Robinson was in um, the production and George was fabulous, so creative, that you'd want to go in and watch him put together a commercial for you when you were selling it, too. You know, it was nice to be able to know the people in traffic and in production and on the air when you were selling. You weren't, I wasn't like separated from that aspect of it. So sales for me went pretty smooth, I think. To mention about Lex, and we were talking about a bit earlier, right? That was surprising, wasn't it, to you when he became a morning guy? Well, I I expected Lex to do very well in radio, and he was real good in in middays. But for him to do to come in after Arf and Rose and Arf and Annie, who I thought were terrific, and he came in with Terry James, and they really took off. They did real well. And it did kind of surprise me that he was able to come in and just pick up and go with it, and to this day is still going extremely strong. And I couldn't be more proud of Lex. He's a super guy, and I still keep in touch with him. He is quite a talent. He is quite a talent. And I remember when he was doing all nights, we'd call him last minute Lex because he'd go racing for the cart and put it in. And it was just his growing. He was he was like just out of college. You know, he was just growing. And to see him really grow and mature into a true broadcast guy and what a great um, merchandiser he is and so well received across the country I couldn't be happier for him and Lex or Chris went on to be a standout in Atlanta. About a 30 year run. Yeah he was on uh, a rock station up there for a long time and then he went into a sports station and did very well there. And uh, again, couldn't ask for a better partner and I couldn't ask for more good things for him than he's had. He's had a great run. And for you over the years, you continue to work in sales. In sales. You know, mainly over that time. What was it that eventually led you to be, you know, to make the decision, hey, you know, I think I'll leave this behind. I think I'll leave, leave radio business. behind. Yeah. A, a gigantic fall off of a 12 foot ladder. Yeah, that's what did it. Uh, I was um, invincible when I was 50, and I was painting the outside of my house. Because at that time, I'm still a single mother of three kids, although they're all grown and gone their separate ways. I was painting the outside of my house. And my kids kept saying to me, don't buy one of those ladders that do all the fancy things. Just get a, well, you know, mom always knew best. And I bought one of the ladders that did all of those crazy things. And I had it upright onto the thing and the catches on the ladder collapsed in on itself and I went down and fell between the rungs and ended up on my back and broke my pelvis and it took a while to recuperate from that. And at that time I was working at EJZ with Buck Weatherby and Rowan and I adored those guys, both of them. I've not worked with people I haven't liked and I was I couldn't do it anymore. I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't keep getting in and out of the car and in and out of the car. And I said, this is a sign it's time for me to leave the business. You have, obviously, a vantage point, having done so much in your radio career, where I think you definitely have the credentials to look at the business and say, you know, look, what is it that you're not seeing now in radio that you should be seeing? What's, not, what's missing for the business now? I don't listen to a lot of radio. To be quite honest with you, I listen a lot to PBS because I'm out of the demo for everybody. But when I do turn in, I do not see creativity. 
I don't see the real true gut creativity. I don't see the competition anymore. I think the LMAs and the duopolies and everybody joining together, no, I don't see that it's working. I, I just don't like it. Uh, that's me personally. It may be working for the big bosses and bringing in the money, but it's pushing away the talent, I think. Um, I, I just don't see it as as creative as it should be. You know, when you're trying to sell a station, and like when I was at Rooster, you know, I had to sell Rooster and Star and ZNZ and all of these other radio stations, and my guys weren't able to take their money and put it where they wanted it to be. You know, I've got a client that really wants country radio, and that's what's going to make his business grow. And I'm supposed to sell it to Star, Easy Listening, News. It, it just, it was like, I, I can't do it. I can't, I can't do it. So I had to leave that behind, too, because it just, it just doesn't make for good sales. And it doesn't make for good radio when you've got that much pressure on a salesperson to go out there and just bring us the money, bring us the money, and don't worry about the client. That is not good for sales. And to have all of these people together and not have competition, I don't think it's good for radio. Jane, great perspective, outstanding stories. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. I appreciate it. Do you know me? Uh, I'm Chris. And I'm J.D. from Rock 105's Morning Rude Zoo. And we're here to tell you tell about... Tell you about the Rock 105 Mega Card. Mega Card. Win fabulous prizes. And cash. And great discounts at area stores. To save cash. The Rock 105 Mega Card can open up a whole new world for you. And get your girl. It cannot. How do you know? Rock 105's Mega Card. Listen to Rock 105 for details. And get yours today. Rock 105, North Florida's Mega Station. Today sounds like a really fine day. Fair skies, warm temperatures, 78 for a high, 61 for a low. No rain, a little bit of breeze. And I'm Jade with the ladies' best information on 1320. You sure? I'm positive. Right. How about a little Fire Lake? How about a little what? Fire Lake by Bobby Seeger. I'll take it, I'll take it. All right, it's from the album Against the Wind. It's a good one right here, honey.